Welcome everybody to the first uh, Antalis Creative Power uh, webinar. Uh, we are really happy to have uh, two great guests uh, today, Emilios uh, Theophanous uh, from Monotype and uh, Anastasios Margenis from the Greenwich University. Uh, the topic today is uh, Type and Design for Good, and Design for Good, and uh, I will leave the, the speech uh, to Anastasios to start. Thank you, Zoram. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you here today. Uh, so I'm going to start saying my screen. So uh, it will help me to go through the uh, through the things I would like to discuss with you today. So give me one second. Um, Okay, okay, Jerome, my screen, great, fantastic. So um, the, when I got the invitation from uh, you guys to talk to you about design and typography for good, uh, thinking about my background coming from uh, an inclusive design, um, I'm thinking that there are ways to engage people. And I know that Emilio's later will focus more on the type aspect, on the typography aspect of this. So I'm gonna give you some kind of overview, first of all, of the work I'm doing, uh, as a professor of inclusive design and head of school of design at the University of Greenwich in London. Uh, and I will talk to you a bit about design processes, how we can design with and we design for the others. So starting, uh, what more common subject than the pandemic? So the pandemic is a measure of change in inclusive design and change the way we see things, change the way we design, change the way we exist in the society. So. And in particularly, it changed uh, not only the way we exist and we design, but also changed time. Time um, uh, is, is, is now irrelevant during a pandemic. Well, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, he mentioned that while time is a measure, measure of change, it does not exist only on its own as a container to put things into. Rather, it depends on what is shifting, reshaping, and what remains the same. So therefore, the pandemic introduced a new time uh, that could save the role of the post-pandemic designer. You, um, for those that don't know, this is the School of Athens uh, from the Renaissance Italian School. So the, I'm using this image here because I want to see that we've been in a society where we had no fear to be across others. We had no fear to engage people. And we had like, we've been, we learn how to design with other people together. So the pandemic in a way changed this uh, approach and asked us to think how we designing from distance, how we use new tools and how we use, um, how we develop new ideas and more inclusive ideas about uh, design processes. So, an example, the product design here, protecting us from the disease. This is the bathrooms designed for previous years during pandemics, during, for example, the 1918 uh, influenza. That is the technology and the products we had at the time. And this is what we have today. So designers based on, uh, on, on different times, um, as, as Aristotle has mentioned, they're trying to find solutions to address issues. And that's perhaps here is a new hospital that we haven't really thought about this perhaps a hundred years ago. So with this massive and unexpected rise of the pandemic since early uh, last year, actually, uh, or early this year, which with the new variations, designers everywhere have been hanging on the research and outputs of the scientific communities, especially the epidemiologists, and building on healthy best practice today. But the sheer volume of research and data and the professional responsibility we bear can be overwhelming. And therefore, since the beginning of the century, time has taught us that while addressing any human disease, it is important that our behaviors can also help minimize the impact of any disease, both communicable like the pandemics and non-communicable like diabetes, heart disease and other chronic issues. So recent research in health related disciplines is now informing how we as designers encourage people to change their habits from reading to getting fit to social interaction, how we as designers, we shape our shapes indoors and outdoors to encourage interaction with others, 
to encourage movement, flexibility, choice, and generally improve mental and physical health. I know that later Emilius will give you some examples based on, on how we change in habits of reading and how the digital type can change the, the way we uh, appreciate and appreciate text. Talking about inclusive design overall, the first thing it comes to our head perhaps is disabilities. And, um, and disabilities, they are visible. However, they are hidden disabilities or mental disabilities that us as designers, we're not, only, we're, not, we're not always taken into account in the design process. So I selected a number of different examples to show you in order to understand more or less how good design can in a way engage people and then how the design process can engage people, um, can co-design with designers and, and user, end users uh, a good product. So this is an airport design I'm gonna show you that uh, restores in a way the passenger's confidence. Designers need to redesign airport experience, for example, after the pandemic in order to address how we're communicating and how we inclusive spatial accessibility. So traveling massively changed, designers changed the way they design for travel. We are now thinking about uh, limited space uh, on, on, on airports. We are thinking that our digital technologies can help us through the trip. And then we are thinking less about the previous experiences we had. Therefore, designers, they need to understand the new passenger. They need to understand who are these people that are traveling, how they travel and how we can communicate with them. However, in the same way, we need to really think about inclusive spaces. We need to consider readability and good design communication to better inform the end user. And then as you have seen, we introduced new languages. In the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, we introduced new toolkits, new graphic language to encourage social distancing. And this is a very good example here where you can see how this new language or existing language is adjusted to address a current problem. And that reminds me a bit of, of hieroglyphics maybe, or, or um, from the Egyptian maybe times, etc where we still are not able, some of those like the, the first two disks, we are not still able to read. However, those kind of new messages, new uh, images, they're giving us new opportunities and also addressing a lot of issues regarding inclusive uh, readability. We introduce new language. So now we are telling people to, to stay apart, uh, just to protect themselves. So we have applied these new rules to our, our everyday uh, lives. We have introduced uh, new design to support visibility issues. We have this, for example, here, a 3D map where it's exploring spaces for people that with visual impairments. So the design process helped in a way to address some issues that we haven't addressed before. However, the COVID area also, the COVID era also um, it gave an opportunity to brands to embrace more human-centering visual identities. Uh, a very good example here is uh, the Burger King of how it was before, how it became after, after the co-design process that happened for the design brand. So the pandemic as a measure of change gave us the opportunity to rethink how was how we used to design before and how now we can use to address the issues that we're facing so accessible design for all in the past post covid workplace is now considered we're designing more uh, with and for others for wider and more meaningful impact we started developing collaborations um uh, a remote collaborations. We start thinking about how we can engage more people from diverse parts of the world, from with different expertise. So the, the, we have been using more um, online tools that we can talk to people. We have reduced uh, the uh, travel. We have, uh, which means that we protect the environment. Perhaps we're responding to some of the 17 sustainable development goals, etc. And we have learned how to coexist together. Uh, in, on a digital space. So technology is changing our habits. 
So designing for the individual and not for the mass production is now more current and more important than ever perhaps before. We have developed technology that actually inclusive design addressing psychological safety. This is a very good example here of how um, uh, uh, this particular um, um, product can help you exist in your local environment when you are spending more time at home and, it's as, as, and it is associated with your everyday activities. So we have developed also understanding about people that surrounding us. So this is a very good exhibition happened in, in the Prado in Madrid, where for the first time, uh, people with, uh, with disabilities can feel the paintings, something that doesn't really happen often in a museum. So we are engaging more with the society, we are impacting more people, and this is extremely important as designers to engage these people in this process. Design is changing and time is going very fast. We have to take a deep breath, maybe do some yoga, slowly count down to 10, start again, and something new will change the way we design. And this perhaps should be the way we as designer need to think a bit more about inclusive approaches. The design in the pandemic uh, and change the way that some brands exist. So, and I know that uh, some of the brands, uh, Emilio will talk to you about that later. So design brands uh, like luxurious brand vanished overnight, which make us rethink who we are and how we exist in society and what's our priorities. The image here is from some workers in India, which is one of the largest producers of luxury brand um, infrastructure. They have the larger infrastructure for luxury brands where a lot of our colleagues in those design disciplines in one night, they lost their job. Therefore, what is happening is we are introducing based on this kind of approach of the pandemic or changing the way that we become more inclusive with changing policies to protect our disciplines. So the European Union, for example, is it came up in early uh, last year with a new creative economy on how to support design discipline, creative industries within um, uh, with a new policy. So that means that we are adjusting, and that is the overall thinking here, that every time there's a difficulty, us as designers, we are the first that we are adjusting in order to respond creatively, more to be more diverse, but also to be more inclusive. The next pandemic is a matter of when, not if. No matter how well prepared we are, no matter how many design tools or design methods we invent in order to engage people, then it is not about when it's gonna happen or if it's gonna happen, but we need to be aware that we will face similar situations. And this is what the work we do here at the University of Greenwich, the, the diversity and inclusivity by design uh, research lab is exploring, is a collaborative research initiative, which embeds diversity and inclusion research in creative spaces, in especially in the areas of art and design through co-design methodologies. The, the, the research we do here in the lab is informing to shape diversity and inclusion policy. We have been working with governmental uh, and non-governmental organizations in order to transform uh, people's life. Uh, um, currently working on projects with Northwest Europe where we are trying to support vulnerable young people to increase skills and confidence through design methods, through co-design methods, and then to engage more and create more meaningful impact. So good design teaching us as how to adjust, how to be diverse, how to be inclusive, and innovation going beyond of the usual methods. Out of the bubonic plague came the Renaissance. Out of the COVID what? Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Anastasios. Uh, I invite our attendees uh, to, to 
type to type their question uh, in the chat or to wait until the end uh, of this webinar to do a live Q and A also uh, with you. And uh, I think it's it's, it's your turn, uh, Emilios. We'll focus on, uh, on yeah. type. I'm here. Let's see if this will work now. We had some issues earlier with uh, sharing the screen, but um, I will give it a go and uh, we will see how it goes. So let me share this and have this here. So let me go back. So is everything okay, Jerome? Can you see the screen? You can see your screen. Okay, thank you. So hello everyone and uh, thanks so much for joining. So my name is Emilio Stefanos and I'm a type director here at the Monotype Studio in London. So design and type for good is such a broad and interesting title and Anastasios touched on so many nice things uh, just right now. So I thought that it would be it would be a bit more beneficial to be quite specific and practical. And uh, so today we can talk a bit about the type accessibility uh, for tech settings and how we can make informed decisions for more accessible and legible designs. So when it comes to type accessibility, the answer is two part. Firstly, how we choose type and secondly, how we use type. So let's start with choosing type and a few things to keep in mind for more accessible typography. There is no magic recipe here, but a few tips and tricks that in combination with correct type usage, as we will see in a bit, uh, will help improve any project. So current palette of choices is practically endless. As I'm sure you're aware, there are so many typefaces to choose from and the monotype library alone has thousands of fonts, but one should not be afraid of these um, expeditions, sort of to say, and if anything, it can be quite rewarding at the end. So of course, so when in doubt, we can always start with the basics. So let's have a look. So when choosing type, our first choice is often between serifs and sans. And the 21st century font usage, mostly in the digital environments we daily interact with, tells us that sans is more legible than serif, but this preference is quite conditioned. So it all depends on what we are looking at. And uh, while the majority of books in print are set in serif fonts, the serifs are very scarce on small screens. So suffice to say, we've grown accustomed to reading sans on screens. So it really depends on the medium of choice for a project. The X height is also a very important choice you have to make because large X heights are generally more legible because they make the type appear larger. In this example, we can see the optical size axis in Helvetica now variable traveling from display to micro and along other optical corrections, we can see that the X height of the typeface is also increasing. So to illustrate, the X height does leave an impression on type. So both of these text blocks uh, are in the same point size, but the one on the right appears considerably larger because of its X height. So I'm sure you might have been in similar situations when you said uh, two type faces of the same point size, but uh, uh, their size appears to be different. And this is usually because of the X height. And uh, among other design details, X height is also something you should keep into consideration when pairing typefaces. So where you, when you are looking, for example, for a sans companion to a serif or vice versa. Aperture is also a good question to ask. So do our letter forms have open or closed apertures? And uh, for you who are not aware of the typographic term, apertures are the openings of letters where the exterior space mixes with the interior space of the character. So for example, here we can see in the line low in the line below that open apertures can promote a horizontal flow and help disambiguate characters in comparison with the line on top, which everything looks more closed. They are also considerably more legible than closed apertures. So the one on the right again appears more legible. So we have to keep this in mind when choosing typefaces for specific usage. Let's say, for example, when type is used in interfaces that require an ambiguous input, such as passwords. Choosing type with unique letter shapes also helps legibility, making type more accessible. So this is perhaps extreme example, but are the character shapes quite unique? Do the G and the nine look alike? 
is the uppercase I and the lowercase L and the number one uh, similar or are they distinct enough? I'm not sure how this, uh, this uh, of, uh, how often this happens, right? One will try it in dot 11, but ambiguous letter shapes can be easily misread. So this ambiguation is important. Talking about spacing, we should ask, is there enough space between letters and words? Usually ample spacing aids in differentiating one letter from another and ensures that words remain distinct elements. So tight spacing, as one can predict, is less legible. Eurostil on the left feels quite cramped, while Frudiger on the right has a more smooth and legible rhythm. And of course, it's important to understand the intended usage of the typeface. So for example, the one on the left, Eurostile, it's a display typeface designed to shine at larger sizes. So choosing type for the intended point size we said texting is equally as important. Next question will be what weight are our letter forms? So as one can imagine, a standard weight, like the one on the right here, or what we call a regular or a book weight, they hold up way better in reduction than the thin weights, which they tend to break and appear fractured when set in small sizes for body copy. Similarly, with bold to black weights, uh, when we set to start uh, long bodies of text, they appear to uh, lose definition as we go in smaller sizes. As with weight, we have to ask what width are our letter forms? Again, standard widths, as one can predict, they make better use of unique letter shapes and uh, than condensed or compressed widths, like we can see in this example here on the left, we have something that is very condensed, while on the right, we have something that is more open, it has a more comfortable flow of text. But of course, again, all, all this depends on the project and the content. So for example, often financial institutions with lots of printed contracts with small legal copy, will prefer a slightly more condensed width, which in the long run can save lots of paper. So the font choice can also provide a more economical body length and uh, provide some sustainability outreach for the company. So we always have to find a balance between accessibility and typography with sustainable sensibilities for efficient designs. Italics or uprights? Well, while italics are rarely used today uh, than, for anything more than emphasis, for example, it's worth noting that they are less familiar to readers and therefore less legible than romance or upright letters. If we go back in time, let's say 15th or 16th century, these italics were the preferred style of the era. So whole books were printed in italic type, which in serif fonts is usually much more economical, saving paper and also making the books cheaper for the time. So nowadays we don't use them as often for long text. So we are less accustomed to reading them. When it comes to case, uppercase letters appear significantly larger than upper and lowercase or just plain lowercase. For small amount of text, they can be very effective. So I'm sure you might have said a headline or a quote in uppercase. But when it comes to whole bodies of text, the similarity of widths and the shapes that appear in uppercase, they make them less legible. So that was choosing type and uh, some of those parameters are things that we as type designers can control, for example, in the design of the typeface. But uh, most of these things are things that are directly under the control of graphic designer by making the sound typographic decisions. So the way we use type and the choices we make after we've chosen type are arguably more important. And of course, bear in mind that accessible typography should not hinder your creativity. So by far the most important choice when using type is the size of the type. As a rule of thumb, use type sizes that are legible for your intended audience. So one should ask, for example, uh, how large is the type I'm setting uh, text in? Is it micro type equivalent to six or eight point in print? Is it more of a text type like nine to 14 or is it more of a display size for larger point sizes? So each of these ranges have its own unique requirements. 
true microtype, as we can see here in Helvetica now variable, has usually wider spacing, a larger X height, less contracts, and more open forms than text or display uh, variants. So uh, these are the things we already discussed before. And similarly, uh, if we see on the other hand, display fonts, they have to be ready for attention or a, a nice close up, for example, we see them like in magazines or headlines in newspapers. So they have to be more refined, have a tighter spacing. And we can see here in this example is called for variable by monotype creatives, the director Tom Foley, as it moves across the optical size. So to illustrate here, we are in the text size and here we are in the display size. So you can see as the changes go along in the design decisions were made uh, for the time phase. We all know that color is an effective communication tool. We see it every day, you know, we see in colors and God. So using color and type is doubly effective. And of course, provided that text and background are working together. So low contrast between type and background can restrain legibility. And similarly, high contrast or vibrating color combinations, they present obvious challenges. And certain color combinations like this one, they are challenging, if not invisible, to those living with color blindness. So statistically, a few people now in this uh, in this uh, this webinar might not be able to see at all uh, what's happening on the screen or see something with very low contrast. So about one twelve uh, men and one two hundred women have issues with color blindness. So polarity when using type and contrast taken to the extreme. So this has an effect on legibility and uh, black on white usually performs way better in legibility tests than white on black. So in uh, the legibility test we did with MIT, black on white text was comprehended a whopping 38% faster than white on black. So to illustrate, this is much more legible significantly than so this, for example. But nowadays, we are also getting used to reading in dark mode or night mode on our phones. So we are reading white text or black. So perhaps future studies will capture this, uh, this change as we become more and more accustomed to reading white and black. So lighting, when we are setting type, the space between the lines of types, it can also impact legibility. Whether it's the comfort of extra space between lines or the feeling of crampedness, impressions uh, do impact legibility and lighting leaves an impression. So for example, here to illustrate, the left block is less inviting than the one on the right. Of course, you can read both of them, and, uh, but the one on the right is much more legible and comfortable to the eyes. And finally, the length of the line or the measure, which can contribute or detract from the legibility of the type. If the lines are too long, they can be fatiguing and lead to readers doubling or mistakenly reading the same line of type two or more times. If the lines are too short, the content looks fragmented, broken uh, into too many pieces for solid comprehension. So analyze the text you're setting and choose a typeface appropriate for the content and medium you're using. So for example, uh, phone screens have so much horizontal space. So don't use uh, a very wide phone that will break every few words. Use line lengths that can promote comprehension. So this is a recap and feel free to take a screenshot. So when you are using, when you are choosing type, sorry, the nine ingredients for legible and accessible typography are a serif or a sans serif choice that fits the reader's expectations for the reading environment you are in. A reasonable X height, remembering that the X height can convey the impression of size of type. Open apertures are more legible in text contents uh, than closed apertures. Choose type with uh, unambiguous forms. Opt for general spacing, though not so wide as to inhibit uh, comprehension. Choose a weight that is neither too heavy or too light, and uh, choose a width that is neither too wide or too condensed. Romance or uprights instead of italics, and uh, use uh, of lowercase or upper and lowercase instead of all caps when setting long paragraphs of text. And when we are using type, the six key ingredients for legible and accessible typography are large enough type for the content, the audience, and the reading environment we're in, 
a color that does not inhibit the readability, discernible by the audience and suited uh, to the reading environment we are, keep sufficient contrast with the background. With polarity, choose black type on a white background as it uh, performs better and uh, keep sufficient lighting to avoid doubling, to promote comprehension and to avoid crowding. And finally, choose um, me a measure of length, uh, of line length that promotes comprehension by also being sympathetic to the text. So now I would also like to briefly talk about some recent projects from the Monotype Studio that take into consideration some of the accessibility principles we just talked about, but also touch on inclusion and diversity subjects that uh, Anastasius already talked about. So as I mentioned earlier, accessible typography should not hinder your creative process. And this is a prime example. So MIND is the UK's biggest mental health charity and design studio in London asked us if we could help them make something ownable and distinctive. So Monotype Studio customized FS Meridian by reviewing the areas of ambiguity in the letter shapes, adapting the proportions, opening the counter shapes, and making all of these small tweaks to improve the readability of the font. So you can see in the top left image here, some of the principles we already talked about taking place for this project. And aside from increased accessibility, Mind Meridian also reflects a growing need for brands and organizations to adopt a more human, a more honest and more authentic approach to design. So accessible typography can be part of the process and not be treated as an afterthought. This is another project, the recent one for m and made with the JKR in London and uh, New York. So the iconic brand got a modern makeover with a revamped purpose of creating a world where everyone feels like they belong. So with a fresh look and updated personalities for the famous m and uh, characters, a more inclusive and welcoming tone of voice and a brand new attention grabbing typeface talk, uh, called All Together. So m and uh, new typography truly reinforces the goal of the rebrand, which is uh, we are all together and there is strength in our diversity. You may also have seen this launch in the past weeks or so. So Every is the new name and brand for Hermes, the UK's largest dedicated parcel delivery company. And Monotype Studio worked with Super Union to make a living and adaptive logotype powered by variable font technology for every parcel, every person, every place. So the design for this, it's in the name itself, it's every for everyone and everything. And our creative response was to represent this diversity and inclusion in the design itself. So every set, they had a fleet of about 5,000 trucks and drivers that needed unique logo types as, you know, each person is unique, each driver is unique. So it created a variable font with more than 190,000 for, uh, yeah, 194,000 unique logo possibilities. And this was quite a fun project to work on. It was really nice to get studios uh, ideas thrown in for all of these led fonts. And lastly, the new identity for New York City Pride. So Monotype, a Lipping Code partner to create up a bold and inclusive new identity for New York City Pride. The goal of the rebrand was to create a feeling of inclusivity and capture the spirit and importance of the organization's home city. And for the identity, two typefaces with strong New York City roots were chosen to represent the brand. Gotham and Knockout, both from New York City-based Heifer and Co. Foundry, now part of the Type Library. So that's it from me as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And um, yeah, let's have some Q&A if you have any questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Emilius. Yes, we uh, do have a question maybe before getting into very specific question from our audience, could you tell us both uh, what brought you to being a type designer and, uh, and you, uh, Anastasios, focusing on uh, design uh, for in inclusive design? Uh, Emilio, so I'm going to start so I can use some time to breathe <laughs> from your presentation. Um, I think that, uh, that it's very interesting here, Jerome, because uh, from my perspective, I am looking the way design 
uh, as an overall thing across different areas where what Emilio showed was it was more focused on typography it was very, very descriptive and very good. I mean, very, uh, the approach was very nice and uh, actually responding to what I was saying earlier. I think that there are two ways here. Either as a designers, we have to think how we design um, and engaging people in this design process. Uh, it, we are, we need to consider people, as you, Emilio said, um, that might be colorblind or uh, the space of where we're displaying our design and what we want to get out of it. We need to think into account, we take into account the uh, even weather conditions. For example, something that's displaying California, it might not be the same as displaying London based on the light or whatever in the surroundings, etc. So I think as designers, we need to be aware and I know one of the questions that someone asked in in the chat here is if there are specific fonts for uh, dyslexia or neurodiversity etc there are there are plenty of, of just to answer the question as well there are plenty of fonts that can respond to some aspect of dyslexia or or neurodiversity but we have to be very specific we have to say that this font is designed particularly for that group of people that they have uh, X, Y, Z needs. So this is the role of a designer for our society now in this 21st century. We need to be more aware and designing in order to address issues. Thanks. Oh, so another, another question about uh, accessibility. So how might we design type revivals, digitiz digitalization with consideration to accessibility, or, or should we? Question from uh, Jean-Luc. I think, of course, so it's um, it's what uh, Stasio is just mirroring what he says, that usually when you have something, it's always part of a larger equation of a larger, um, uh, in a project, there are so many parameters one has to consider. So it's not always uh, only the typeface or not always just the paper or where you uh, present things or what your target audience is. So you have to take all these things into account when you're designing. And um, I mean, of course, when it comes to um, revivals or digitization, so we can make something that uh, sp speaks of a specific era and genre, but of course you can have uh, all of these accessibility parameters I just talked about um, infused into the design, so revival doesn't mean it has to be, you know, identical or mirrored, it might be just inspired from a um, from a certain era or have uh, has uh, certain cultural sensitivities of the type uh, uh, one is um, using for. So, yeah, I'm just trying to go through the, the question. Um, is there a specific trend in type these days? This is a very nice question, Naomi. We also, we usually, sorry, let me find the link. We actually do have uh, a trends report that every year is done from our creative uh, type directors, uh, Phil and Charles. So I will find the link and put it in the chat uh, for everyone to go around, which is very interesting to see. I'm finding this now. Uh, Emilius, I will step in until you find the link. Uh, there are some kind of questions that come into the chat that are talking about um, uh, different disabilities, different uh, inclusive approach design. If there's a specific font that we use for print or digital or or what is the trends at the moment, etc. So I just want to say what you just in a way to take what the comment you make about sustainability earlier. And I think that the trend at the moment is that we follow, we're trying to respond to current uh, uh, issues and problems that we're facing, sustainability, for example. And I was thinking about how as designers, we're taking, let's say, the, the United Nations Sustainable Goals into our design process. And what does it mean? It means that we are designing um, to, to save the environment, let's say, okay, how do we do that? Uh, online collaboration, let's create a font, let's say, or uh, or reducing printing because some of you you mentioned in the chat that is the same font for print or digital. I think I think these kind of ideas and concepts they change the way we design, and I think that this is perhaps how we are responding to current trends by applying problems into the design and then find solutions. Thanks, and maybe I would have uh, myself have a question. Uh, do you see various or different trends 
between a type for prints and type for digital? Are they going in the same direction or the really rather opposite? opposite? I think it depends and it usually again depends on project and the context, but uh, it, it's also what the audience expect. Like, uh, like I said earlier, usually if we are going on, a, let's say publishing for books, one would expect like a more comfortable serif and uh, for casual reading. But uh, if we are reading um, uh, on screens, like uh, news, uh, for example, we might expect uh, a sans serif. So it all depends on the medium and the audience that uh, you're touching for. So, so long story short, it would be, yes, there are quite trends that go in different parts, but there are also, uh, are the, um, how do you say, uh, trusted and tested uh, typeface that can really they get the content out without having too much of uh, character themselves, for example. So uh, it all depends to what you are looking to um, shout. Uh, I'm just trying to see the question. Uh, Emilius, I have a question. Like, like, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a question, Emilius? Of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 perhaps that may be the question that others they would like to hear as well. I mean, uh, um, specifically about type design and uh, type designers. So what is the trend, going back to the trends, what is like the trend of hiring someone uh, in, in, in the in, in, in type industry? So what knowledge uh, is expected from someone that joining uh, a type foundry? And are those areas of diversity and inclusivity essential uh, for someone as well to be hired? So in terms of knowledge, it can be, you know, you, you just have a good eye for, for type. It doesn't have to, uh, you know, you doesn't have to have finished uh, 10 universities to be a type designer, for example. And uh, what's, uh, what's interesting nowadays is that um, the type design tools have become more accessible and cheaper than what they were, for example, 10 years ago. So a lot of graphic designers play and experiment with and they, um, uh, they inquire the knowledge needed for uh, for type design or for smaller projects, let's say a lettering or a local type or something uh, like this. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, cultural sensitivity as well, it's also important because, for example, I cannot draw the entire scripts of the world. So, you know, there's so much brain in here. So it's usually good to, not good, It's this is usually the... Uh, the process. So when we're designing for a script, we are not accustomed with or the cultural sensitivities of the script. Uh, we talk with the designer that it's uh, local and uh, they can approach the design with uh, uh, the heritage it deserves, for example. But uh, I'm also, what you said, what I said, I wanted just to elaborate more. I'm really happy for what is happening in the design scene nowadays with uh, especially young people uh, getting their hands on dirty in a sense and playing with type in ways that we've never seen before. Like, uh, I mean, the people I follow on Instagram online, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, experiments, which is really, really nice because sometimes um, um, working um, in experimental ways can, uh, uh, can push the whole field uh, uh, further. And perhaps I don't have the time to experiment as much as the projects are quite specific. Uh, you know, you have to design this, uh, uh, which will serve these purposes uh, in my work day, I mean. So, but uh, when you're young and you were a student like I was, it was much easier to go around and, uh, you know, discover the world. And I'm sure you see it as well, um, the university analysis with people, you know, they go out and wild because these are things that uh, sometimes you only do in university. Real life is a bit different uh, with everything that it includes. But to add more on that, I don't know if Jerome wants to come in, but um, I going back to what I was saying earlier about technology is giving us that space to do it. I've seen a lot of uh, designers that uh, they're disabled designers and they are they might be dyslexic, they might be colorblind, but then they're engaging more than design process. And I think that that if it's a message to come out from this webinar in a particular, it will be that we have to give the space to those people that mm -hmm. that they are aware of either for personal experience or of or circumstances or of, of, of other people they might know or the environment they grow up or the knowledge they may have 
to bring this knowledge to the design because I think that design will only get better when we are able to include more people and be born diverse. Yeah, I agree. It's kind of a good conclusion because I cannot see any uh, further question. Uh, I wanted to yeah, comment and also explain the topic of this webinar was also in link with the awards because we have the design for good category and the project uh, you shared uh, Anastasio Anastasio's uh, touch the art at Prado is really uh, interesting and I've seen that we start to receive project to receive project like this in this category uh, so uh, Emilio she will have uh, the chance to uh, discover some uh, as a jury member uh, to wrap up also, yeah, uh, thank you both. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for this uh, really inspiring uh, moment. I invite our audience to follow us on, uh, on the social media. Don't hesitate to uh, submit project, especially in uh, this category. We really want to highlight the work of, the work of a committed designer that want to uh, change uh, the world, that want to make the world more inclusive, more diverse, uh, more sustainable. And, uh, and also, yes, thank you very much uh, to Monotype, our partner, uh, for this webinar and for the new worlds. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, Jerome and Anastasius. Thank you for, for having this talk today. I think it was really nice. Thanks for the audience as well. Some very, very interesting, interesting questions. So thank you.